All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gyms, lots of new studio setup, lots of we don't know how this is going to go. But let's. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm doing, Sifu. How are you? Good, good, good. So uh, here we are in this new setup. Now, we're not going to do every episode exactly like this, but we're trying out a couple different uh, formats, uh, especially for when right. you can't make it into the city, uh, that we still have a way to record because, you know, I like recording with you in the studio. It's way easier if I can actually see you and, and deal with your hot nonsense. But, uh, you know, with our schedules and everything, it's been kind of difficult to uh, get this working. And uh, so we're going to try this out. Obviously, the, the main concern with this is the quality of the audio uh, um, for those who listen to us on audio. So for, for those of you who are listening to us on audio, we're definitely going to try to work out the kinks to make sure that we get a really, really clean audio for you guys. Because oh, yeah. I know sometimes when we do these live or in-studio recordings, it can be a little echoey or it can sound like, you know, someone is recording off their phone or whatever. So we're going to try our best. So anyway, thank you for bearing with us. Uh, very cool to see you guys. And uh, as always, if you want to uh, support the Kung Fu Genius, the best way to support the Kung Fu Genius is on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Kung Fu Genius. You get access to early episodes, all sorts of little goodies, including my Instagram subscriber only reels. I also post to Patreon as well. And yeah. uh, Dre and I were talking uh, just last night about doing some regular lives, but having those live episodes exclusively for our Patreons about a week before we'll publish them on YouTube. So we'll essentially have kind of private live episodes for our Patreons and they'll get it a week early. And then a week later, we'll post that as a regular video on YouTube and stuff. So we're going to try and see how that works out. Uh, so anyway, right Dre, uh, how you doing, man? Everything good? So far, so good, Sifu. All how right. So, so what, you got, what you got for me? Okay, first up, we got Benny Aruba. Benny Aruba in the I house. I love this name. Yeah, this is a great name, man. I wish I had a name like this. So, so cool. I wish you had a name like that, you too. Know? Better than Dreyson. Yeah. Oh, way better. So uh, he's asking, I'm 40 now and look at 32-year-olds as really young. Somewhat one's physical peak. What causes cerebral edema was it a combination of being super active mentally and physically 24 7 too little rest and too much cocaine or just genetic misfortune all right um well i appreciate the vote of confidence uh on mr benny okay. aruba on my medical knowledge as a completely non-medically trained non-professional um, I, you know, I teach Wing Chun for a living and about once a week I go on a podcast and talk about Kung Fu stuff. Um, okay. but I, I don't know I why suddenly pe pe people get the impression that, um, <laughs> I can give uh, diagnoses and medical breakdowns on this stuff. I think right. that's also a bit of an issue. It's like, you know, the fact that pe some people are Bruce Lee fans or they're into this stuff, they, they give opinions in, uh, topics and subjects that they have absolutely no training in. And when it comes to medicine, um, I wow. took a, a first aid course about four times in my life, which included CPR. So those four first aid and CPR yeah. courses would basically cover the extent of my medical training. So, uh, <laughs> um, but here's the thing. And, uh, and, you know, Dre, we talked about this last night, and it's 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 kind of a weird thing to have to say. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in an odd position when it comes to this topic now, not because of people asking me for medical advice uh, when I, in fact, cannot give any, um, but uh, actually another problem. And uh, so here's the beautiful thing about the Kung Fu Genius podcast. Besides the fact that I get to sit here and talk about what I love with you on a weekly basis or with other people. Um, mm -hmm. The crazy thing is when I started this podcast, I never knew that it would put me in touch with so many people who know a lot of stuff about Bruce Lee, about Wing Chun, about Kung Fu, about history, Hong Kong movies, whatever that would contact me and give me information that I had never seen before. 
or give me information that I had no access to or that a lot of other people don't have access you didn't to. see this coming. Yeah. And that's been the really great thing. So, uh, and a lot of that stuff I, I can't and won't and don't talk about on the podcast. The private messages I got from people all over the world, including people that are very well known to a lot of our podcast listeners. And recently we did an episode talking about the May 10th collapse. And I talk about um, the book by Marcus Okanya about uh, uh, Bruce Lee's death, which I thought was really good. By the way, um, the, the book, The Death of Bruce Lee, which we talked about, I think on the last episode or last episode, last yeah. episode, whatever, uh, you know, was the reason I got it is because someone told me like, oh, not only does it have all the information about Bruce Lee's death and all the documents and everything, but it also talks about the drug letters and puts that into context. Um, mm -hmm. And I got the book and the book that I got didn't have the drug letter stuff in it. And then I was told by many great commenters that, oh, it's uh, apparently in a second edition. Well, the author of The Death of Bruce Lee uh, actually listened to our podcast and uh, he's sending wow. me that updated version, which has the drug letter stuff in there. So I'm, awesome. I'm very excited about getting that. So for all of you who keep all right. telling me this, uh, uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, but also since that episode came out, uh, I got contacted by someone who, um, well, I don't know how to put this gingerly because I, 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 I don't want to betray this person's trust, but I have to say something oh. because uh, Dre, I'm, I'm not going to talk about Bruce Lee's death anymore on this podcast. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a topic um, I can't talk about. It. And I know that that sounds really weird and it sounds maybe suspicious or maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, a bit churlish to the audience. I don't know how to describe it. Um, but uh, I was, I was sent something uh, okay. that uh, has completely changed uh, what I understand about Bruce Lee's death. And I'm going to say this, it, it, it's nothing conspiratorial. Like it's no tinfoil hat shit. It's not, oh, I found out Bruce Lee was murdered and I know who did it. It's not, uh, I got threatened by someone who didn't want the information. It's none of those things. Uh, the only way I can put it is I was sent some very... Uh, definitive evidence about what most likely happened on the day Bruce Lee died and the circumstances mm. involving his death. And I find the source extremely credible and I find the information very plausible. And uh, as a result, um, I, I can't discuss Bruce Lee's death. Uh, and I know that sounds weird, and I'm sure that half our audience is going to feel like, oh, what the hell, dude? If you know it, why don't you say it? And the problem is that that would be a betrayal of trust to the person who sent me this information because it is, I'm not going to say classified, but is highly confidential. And uh, uh, so half the audience is going to be like, oh, it's some kind of weird cop out or like I'm being like a dick or something like that. And I understand if people feel that way and I understand why people feel that way. And the other half of it is going to, uh, the other half of the audience is going to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, Bruce Lee's death, whatever. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. You're just making this up. You're just yes. trying to do this for views or whatever. Right. Um, as if my stunning uh, uh, attempt for views is going to be like the Kung Fu genius announces, you will never talk about this subject again. <laughs> like why would people keep tuning in? I, I'm not going to talk about it again, wow. but the problem is that, um, I can say for the, the first time in my life, I feel extremely confident. I understand the circumstances of Bruce Lee's death and uh, uh, it's closed for me. Uh, so uh, obviously you're my boy. We discussed that Mikey Dean's my boy. You know, the people who are closest to me, you know, I can let them know more or less what the circumstances are, but I cannot publish this openly. I can't talk about it on the podcast. I won't say who, even the people who I do tell, I'm not going to say who or what or whatever. I'm just going to do it in the most vague terms. Um, but just say that, you know, these things are going to, I'm, I'm not going to say who the information's from or what it's like, where I got it from or anything like that. Um, I can just say, uh, this is what I really plausibly believe right now. And I believe it on very, very good authority. And you can either choose to believe me or not. Um, 
but uh, that's not fodder for the podcast. So, um, so Dre and our podcast audience members, uh, um, I'm done talking about Bruce Lee's death. So, uh, what about okay? But what about seventy eight percent of the questions that we get are based on that topic? It's not seventy eight percent. It's just seventy eight percent of the ones you pick. All right. Uh, so all I'm gonna uh, say is pick some other ones, Dre. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, as I'm very fond of saying. Next question. Oh man. Oh man. All right. Let me let me do some scrolling then. Oh no. <laughs> some scrolling. Uh, yeah, I know. Some scrolling. Death question. Death question. Scrolling. Death question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dryson much... question. Scroll. Dryson yeah. question. Scroll. Okay. Yeah. Um, Maybe scrolling and, and, I... and comment on it. Uh, by the way, for people who uh, follow me on Instagram, uh, at the Kung Fu Genius, uh, uh, recently I just posted a um, a reel, and uh, the reel was edited by Mikey Dean of the Kung Fu Genius podcast, and it is a uh, it is it is basically all the times Dre has said Dreisen or Doctor Eisen uh, on the uh, on the podcast, and wow. it's like a mashup, and it's hysterical. I put it here on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, in the new, yeah, I'm now starting to post some shorts from Instagram. And then I also posted it on, uh, Instagram. It's really great. Give it a like, give it a share. If you guys are fans yeah. of the podcast, I think you'll appreciate it. So what's the next question? I, I'm, I'm sure Mikey Dean put a lot of work into finding those, uh, Dreisen's mentions. Oh, I'm sure it was a pain in the ass. And they're more or less in sequential order. Did I get that correct? Yeah. But you know, we don't have all of the episodes up on the on the Google Drive. So I think there's a few There's a couple missing ones. Okay, yeah. we can fill those in and add oh, and have the the I supreme think... ultimate mashup of Dryson's. Um okay, uh, all right Dre, what you got for me? I think I have one with uh nothing related to Bruce Lee's death. Okay. Okay. It's uh JPS Steve Shanahan. Your favorite name. Asking, uh this sounds similar to that one story where the late James the mile supposedly came close to pulling the trigger on a gun he was concealing underneath his jacket at the time during a heated argument with Bruce. Something like that. Okay, but I don't know so, what story he's referencing or from what uh, from what podcast. You're just like this sounds a lot like like what sounds a lot like Gray. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, well, I don't know. Is this is this question a month podcast. old, two weeks old? I I actually don't remember. I I. I don't remember. I, I don't know. Maybe he's talking about what did I talk about Bruce Lee owning a Derringer? Did I talk about that? The gun, the small gun. Hmm. See, I can't tell because I talk about Bruce Lee so much with not just on the podcast, but just like with my students and places that I go that I don't remember. Like, oh, did I tell that Derringer story oh, on the podcast? Or would, did I tell that to like Antonio and Barry last week after training? I can't remember. Um, the yes, there is a story. Uh, you know, at the the end, I suppose, of Bruce Lee's time in Seattle, uh, mm -hmm. he had a little bit of a split between himself and some of his more senior students, namely the aforementioned James DeMille and also Jesse Glover. And then there was some talk about, you know, Bruce Lee teaching things in a way that they didn't like, which I always thought was kind of funny, like, um, you can also kind of see the psychology of Bruce's early teaching period. You know, Bruce was uh -huh. kind of like one of the guys, right? He was this young kid from Hong Kong who learned this fighting style. And when he was teaching these guys, he taught them in a relatively informal kind of way. And it was like a bunch of guys getting together and kind of, he was showing them this stuff, but of course he was the guy who knew it. He was the guy that they respected. He was the teacher. But I think that there's something to be said for Bruce's age when he was teaching um, his art in Seattle, which uh, you could call something between Wing Chun and Jeet Kune Do, I suppose. Um, okay. It, it really, the, what Bruce Lee was teaching in Seattle really didn't have a name until he later told Taki Kimura that, you know, it's Chun Fan Kung Fu or Jeet Kune Do. But really in those early periods, he didn't really want to call it Wing Chun because he wasn't purely teaching Wing Chun and he had not yet coined the term Jeet Kune Do yet. Um, right. Many of Bruce Lee's own students have uh, done what I think is really good um, and 
actually James Bishop, who I had on the podcast before, the guy who did the source book for the Jeet Kune Do, Tao of Jeet Kune Do, he actually said something like what he appreciated about some of the Seattle era students is that Jesse Glover called what he did non-classical Gong Fu. So he, in essence, completely sidestepped the whole Jeet Kune Do argument or the whole is it Wing Chun argument. They came up with their own name for what they did rather than trying to adopt one of Bruce Lee's names or whatever, like for what he was teaching. And, uh, you know, uh, Joe Cowles, I think, called it what he did, Wu Wei Kung Fu and stuff like that. And there's something admirable about that. Uh, and James DeMille called what he did uh, Wing Chun Do. Um, but what you definitely see here is a very early Bruce Lee who perhaps had not quite learned how to manage that line between we're, we're all friends, but I'm also still your instructor and that there has to be some kind of respect given to the instructor. Like I'm the one with the knowledge because I think the problem was he was very green as an instructor and he was also the same age as all of these dudes. So I think what happened was, is that he was friends with a lot of his students, but I think that that line between teacher and student was very blurred, especially in those early, in that early period. So it, it's kind of understandable that at some point when Bruce started to, because it seems that there was a period towards the end of Bruce's time in Seattle where he was trying to teach things a little bit more, for lack of a better term, professionally. Like even there, this, it was a bunch of photos where they're kind of wearing uniforms and he seemed uh -huh. to teach in a more formal way. Whereas in the very early days, it's him, you know, in a parking garage showing Jesse Glover and James DeMille packs out and traps and stuff like that. And then there's these photos when he had a more formal school where he was wearing a uniform and it looked a little bit more formalized, like he might want to teach slightly more professionally. And when he started doing that, his some of his early period students like James DeMille or Jesse Glover seemed to take issue with that because uh, and, oh, wow. and and I, I know this from my own personal teaching experience that uh uh, your senior students are the ones that you can count on the most. And they're the ones that are there for you. Let's say most of your senior students, but there's a percentage of your senior students who are always going to wish everything never changed from the days when they started. And that's always a problem in martial arts schools, right? Um, especially martial arts schools that have longevity and that are taught in a more traditional way. Perhaps a kickboxing gym that's just teaching kickboxing and it, and they don't have that same kind of relationship with their students as more traditional martial arts do of kind of a mentor and a mentee kind of thing. Maybe yeah. those more modern sport arts don't have that, but uh, for sure, many of them obviously do. Um I, and I know this from my own personal experience as the school grows and you start to expand and formalize things a little bit, a percentage of your senior students are going to be like, I don't like that <laughs> because mm -hmm. they are fond for the way it was when they started. And the truth is if you're a, <clears throat> if you're a honest Sifu that is interested in teaching the best way for your students, you can't always teach things the same way because your school evolves, the atmosphere evolves, the size evolves, and also the needs of the students change over time. When I first started teaching Wing Chun over 20 years ago, people, many of my students just wanted to come to me because it was Wing Chun. Uh, nowadays, some people still come to me for that, but people come maybe because of the benefits that they might get from martial arts training. And the questions are different. You know, uh, I remember when I started teaching, I still got many questions from prospective students about what's the difference between our Wing Chun and other Wing Chun. And what's the difference between the way we do Chi Sao and other people do Chi Sao and blah, 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 blah. And now uh, I rarely get those kind of questions when new students come in. It's just, they come because they saw the IP man movie. They come because they want to learn to defend themselves or they come because they just want to do martial arts, right? So my initial... Oh, we just, oh, just lost. Uh, okay, there we, we go, just lost, there we go. Yeah, back. we just blipped out for a moment, but we're back. Okay, good. Um, you know, my early period students, the only way they could find me was because I was teaching Wing Chun and they were hardcore into Wing Chun. Um, and the interesting thing is, if you're a Wing Chun Sifu, most Wing Chun Sifu spend all of their time trying to market their school to Wing Chun people. 
But the joke is okay. you don't need to market to Wing Chun people. You know why? Because if Wing Chun people want to find Wing Chun, they'll find you because they, they are specifically looking for it. And if they are already doing Wing Chun and they don't like your lineage, it makes no sense wasting advertising dollars to preach to someone else's choir. All right. Um, so Wing Chun people, if they want their schools to thrive, need to advertise outside of the weird walled garden that is Wing Chun. Because what happens is when your school is small, the only people that find you are the hardcore Wing Chun people that want to learn from you. So there's this immediate confirmation bias like, oh, all the people who come to me are really hardcore into Wing Chun when the school is new and small. But as the school grows and more and more people come because of word of mouth and more people are coming and you have a good atmosphere and stuff like that, you're going to get more and more students who maybe didn't even hear of Wing Chun uh, when they joined. And so you have to then teach in a way that is not only for the hardcore enthusiast, but also for the everyman. Because as much as it bothers Wing Chun people who think they're so no, only want the training to be just hardcore for Wing Chun people – what they don't realize is, well, a good school can still provide hardcore training for the most hardcore motivated enthusiasts in separate classes, instructor classes, sparring, intensive classes. But okay. the average person who's not like a Kung Fu head or a martial arts head, they're the ones that need martial arts more than the Wing Chun person because they need it to improve their lives. So as the school grows, so are the needs of the students and the prospective students. So... I can imagine that something similar to this, maybe on a smaller scale, happened to Bruce Lee towards the end of his tenure in Seattle, where he started to just get more people because there was a little bit of word of mouth. And maybe his senior students were like, I don't like the way he's teaching now. He's, you know, and I'm not going to say watering down because that always implies that uh, only the really hardcore people understand Wing Chun. And if you teach something in a way that's relatable to the public, that by default means it's watering down. I don't think so. I, I mean, a good martial arts school, like I said, if you want to have your hardcore students, you can have separate classes for the hardcore types and provide it for them and have a class that's for the general audience, right? And maybe Bruce Lee didn't realize that he could do this. That uh, yeah. okay. because they, you know, in the 50s and 60s, the the martial art business systems weren't really there that you could have a class for every people. And then you could have a special intensive class for your hardcores or for invitation only kind of thing. Right. But also because I think you have that natural evolution in the Seattle school where you had more students and maybe less hardcore types. And then you had these senior students who they were with Bruce when he didn't have any students. And I know this because a very similar thing happened in my school. Some of my most, I was with you when you didn't have any students. And, uh, you know, here you are now, you know, teaching things uh, um, that we had to wait six months for. Now you're teaching it a little bit more quickly. Right. And they feel like pissed oh, off. Right. Wow. And, and, and I get it. Like I've been through all those growing pains and I understand them. By the way, it's only a percentage of the senior students. Like, uh, the majority of your senior students, they're, they're your ride or dies. They're with you no matter what. And, and they understand the evolution. And they're there during that evolutionary process. And a certain group of them fold their arms because they like to be, as I call them, Mr. Si Heng. And they, mm -hmm. don't like, and they don't like other people having easier access to the stuff than they got, right? So um, I can imagine something similar like this happened between James DeMille, Jesse Glover, and Bruce Lee. But apparently things got a little bit more contentious than that. So much so that uh, I believe it was the last time James DeMille went to go see Bruce at his school. He just went by to see him. I think he wasn't sure what was going on because he felt that Bruce was pissed off at him because uh, it had come to Bruce's attention that James DeMille was saying stuff like, ah, oh, Bruce is watering it down. He's not teaching all these things that he used to teach us or whatever. And in some kind of proactive attempt at self-defense, James DeMille showed up to Bruce's school with a gun just in case stuff got off the rail, which is a crazy story. I met James DeMille, the late James DeMille. I've, I famously fought in his school against a jujitsu exponent, which I've talked about in a very early podcast. And, you know, one of the highlights of my career was beating a jujitsu guy using Wing Chun in front of James DeMille. I mean, I think in terms of as many high points as I've had as a teacher, I think in terms of my martial arts career, 
that was probably the high point. And then after that, yeah. having the chance to talk to James DeMille for half hour, one hour about Bruce Lee. So I know I've met James DeMille personally. Um, and I just find the story. I, I didn't know the story then when I met him. Had, had I known it then, I, I, I would have asked him, right? Um, yeah. But the thing is, I don't know. Because remember, whenever you're hearing someone tell a story, you're hearing them tell the story from their perception which even if they tell it in the most open and honest way to the best of their abilities, it's still limited by their perception of events from their perspective, which means it's automatically going to have either bias or it's going to have missing information. So that's why I'm always a fan of when I do research of uh, like the Wong Jack Man story. I want to hear that story told by four different people who were there, including people who are not on Bruce Lee's side. Because I find that it's only in the compar comparison and contrast of the different viewpoints of the same story that you can, you can kind of boil down what they all said in common, because that mm -hmm. can probably be agreed upon. And then you can parse out the differences and whether they are actually true or not to the best of your ability. But when you just listen to the narrative of one person and then take that as the story, um, then I think that's problematic, which is why like, not to, not to bring it back. Cause I actually don't want to talk about the whole Bruce Lee death thing. I had read and listened to so many perspectives and seen so many different things that when this information came to me, it was like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. So, um, but that only made sense to me because I have read so many different accounts of Bruce Lee's death and saw where all the holes were. And you have to take everything that you investigate in that kind of way. Like, look, listen to all the people, including the people you don't like and you don't agree with. You have to listen to the crackpot theories about Raymond Chow trying to murder Bruce Lee. You have to listen yeah. to that and to, to understand part of why people think that way. And also to be able to dismiss it based on the actual evidence rather than the hearsay. So anyway, uh, what else you got for me? Oh, man. You better right, have some good ones for me because I don't have yeah, dad jokes today. I got dirty jokes. So when did you come to that realization in, in the early days when you like, wait, I got to teach. I got to cater more towards the everyday people. Um, it, no, no, it's it's when the school starts growing because you have a um, you have a sampling bias. Every school has a sampling bias when they start, and that's why when I listen to the really hard, the really yeah, it means that just that little group of what you can see. Let's say you only have five students, you base uh -huh. everything you know about how people learn Wing Chun and how to teach Wing Chun based on these five hardcore students that you have, and. Wow because you only have a small sample, your evidence is skewed. You have to, if you really want to know you, what is it like to teach Wing Chun en masse to a large group, well, then you got to teach a large group for a long period of time. until, And then you can start to, to make decisions on that. Sometimes my colleagues in the Wing Chun world, in the different lineages, especially the more conservative guys, the guys that teach so traditional because they believe that classical Wing Chun cannot be altered in any way ever by any means necessary. Otherwise, we are essentially apostates. I mean, the, the, the comparison to organized religion, the, 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 the comparisons to organized religion and traditional martial arts are very very clearly, almost one to one in most instances, you can draw oh, okay. parallels to uh, the the ideas found in religion, the way religion is spread, the way religion is promoted and uh, uh, um, proven by its adherents. And you you hear all these same arguments for the most traditional purists within Wing Chun and traditional martial arts. So you get these guys that are like, I teach in the most traditional way. And I teach super, super classical Wing Chun. And then when you look at it, you go, yeah, and they still have a kind of a small school. Or they teach in very, very small groups. And that is super easy to do. And for me, I do the same thing. I do that in my instructor classes. I do that in my intensive classes. I do that in my private lessons. I teach in a very hardcore and I'm not going to say traditional. I, see, I teach the classical Wing Chun, but I teach it in a more modern way. But I teach it, let's say, more hardcore to the people who do private lessons, to the people who take instructor classes or do special classes with me, the regular class, 
has to be for everyone. They have to come and they have to learn some self-defense. They have to improve their body mechanics, their posture, the way they move. They have to um, learn the martial art. Uh, they have to get a good workout. All right. Because these are the things that people, the average people who are not Wing Chun heads want to get. And then, of course, if someone does want to get classical Wing Chun, they can also get it in there as well. But the regular class has to cater to a diverse group of needs. Uh, so you have to have self-defense, classical martial art, body health, mental improve all the things that kind of improve body and mind. And then you all obviously have the workout and the classical Wing Chun component in there. But then for your special classes, you can become really hardcore and really old school. Um, but the problem is that many Sifus don't want to do that uh, because they, they think that it's selling out. And I go, no, I think you're kind of a sellout when you're too much of a Wing Chun snob to want to mm. give your amazing, to not want to give your amazing art to someone who it's beneath you to teach them. I think that's an, a terribly entitled attitude by some of these really staunch traditionalists. Like the students have to, you know, meet my expectations in order for me to want to teach them. That is a very traditional, very old school, uh, somewhat Confucianist ideology that has dug its way into traditional Chinese martial arts. And I think it's outmoded and I think it's arrogant and I think it's stupid because if you have a very hardcore, very serious, very dedicated student who really wants it and is going to work hard, that is the easiest student to teach because you can tell that student, you can show that student the first set of the Siunam Tao form and say, okay, you got it? All right, now I want you to go in the corner and I want you to practice for half an hour. And they'll go and do it. <laughs> and they'll do you it. know what I, I mean? And then you'll come back, you'll give them some corrections and they'll take those corrections to heart and they'll fix it and they'll practice for another half hour. You can't do that with a normal person uh -oh. because they don't have that internal motivation that the hardcore student has. So the problem is when you only accept hardcore students, those very traditional Sifus tend to overestimate how good of a teacher they are. It's super easy to teach highly motivated wow. people. It's super easy to teach senior students who've been with you for years and already have the foundation. You want to show me if you're a good teacher, teach someone who's not physically coordinated, teach someone who's not the most hardcore and the most motivated in Wing Chun. And also, you know, teach someone who comes to you because they need the benefits of the martial art you teach not the prestige of being your student or something like that. And then you can tell me if you're a really good right. teacher or not, you know, un until you've done that, you're just some, you're just an enthusiast who teaches other enthusiasts and that's no stress on your abilities as a teacher. But I also find that there's something very arrogant about this attitude. And that attitude is I don't teach people who are beneath my uh, motivation. And I, pardon my French. Fuck you, dude. All right. You're, you're really that guy that people need to line up to learn from, or you just want to keep that as the perception of yourself. If you mm -hmm. want to show me that you're a good teacher, teach the average person who needs martial arts. If you want to show me that you're a good person in terms of your art, then teach it to people who are not the most hardcore. All right. I don't want to come to someone's school and see that they have five hardcore students and then hear what a great teacher they are. Um, I, I feel that they're copping out. All right. Especially if they run a school. I'm not talking about someone who just wants to teach one or two people to keep up their own practice. I'm talking about people who okay. purport to teach professionally. Um, so anyway, uh, what else you got for me? All right. If you got nothing for me, I got dirty jokes. I have no dad jokes today. No, we don't need that. We don't need that. We yeah, we do. We want mm -hmm. to stay monetized. Okay, here's a here, well, here's a mild one. Oh no, it's a space joke. It's just a <laughs> statement. It's just a statement. Dear NASA, oh, no. your mom thought I was big enough, Pluto. All right, okay, what you got? Oh man, all right, so we got. Yeah, we that's got not even a, that's not even a timely space joke. Pluto stopped being a planet a very long time ago. <laughs> the finger at the pump right. that the KFG. Yes. What you got? Uh, John Day. John Day is, uh, you guys should get Austin St. John. Who's Red that? Ranger from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers on the podcast. He became an EMT after he left the show and helped out soldiers in either Iraq or Afghanistan. 
he kept active and still practices martial arts? Uh, yeah, that's great. The problem is that uh, I did not grow up on Power Rangers, <laughs> so I I don't have any connection to the Power Ranger. The, the 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 White Power Ranger, the main guy, he just passed away yeah. uh, like a couple months ago or whatever, and I what? I didn't even. I, I didn't know anything about that guy's story. Um, yeah, no, no. The, I, I'm a little bit. I know some people think I'm younger than I am. I'm a, older than I look. I think. Um, I I'm yeah. I miss the Power Rangers thing. I was already I, I, when when Power Rangers were a thing. I was I or had already discovered girls. So yeah, Power, I, Ra Power I Rangers Power Rangers had uh, no chance for me. I had to be a teenager because I was making fun of the uh, the theme song. And the Go Go if, Power if Rangers. I was a little younger. I would have probably got into it. Yep. Yeah. Um, and and also, I mean, if you look at the types of interviews we do on this podcast, it's uh, you know, it's Bruce Lee related stuff. It's Matt Pauly, John Little, Steve Carriage, or it's sometimes movie stuff. I have Frank Jang on here for ten questions. Uh, Bobby Samuels, uh, you know, Vincent Lin. Uh, people who worked in Hong Kong and are related to the Hong Kong film industry. Um, we are a Kung Fu podcast. So uh, I, I, I don't know how well a former Power Ranger fits into uh, the our, our broader audience. I, I don't know if it's really quite quite the thing. Uh, and also, I, I just don't know anything about the Power Rangers. Um, well, didn't they film in uh, Hong Kong? Power Rangers? I, first of all, I have no idea. H having just glimpsed a couple episodes in passing, yeah. you know, while flicking through the channel as a teenager, um, uh -huh. uh, I don't think that stuff was shot in Hong Kong. It looked like it was shot in Japan in the same studios where they shot stuff like Godzilla. That would just be my guess, but I could be totally wrong, but I also don't care. Like I, I, I also don't get like I please I I, I because the moment I say this I get in the comments people are gonna give me the entire history of the Power Rangers and uh, the truth is that I'm interested in many things in martial arts Power Rangers probably on a list of about a thousand topics in martial arts uh, it's probably 997 on my list of things that I would want to talk about I tell you what though, yeah wow. Right? 10 years ago, and it was up on YouTube for maybe a day. Uh -huh. Someone had done a 15 minute adult version of Power Rangers. A 15 minute adult version of Power Rangers, like according to Mike. That, like they're 15 years older. Oh, like I see, I see. Like, and they're like, it's like really gory. Okay. And it's like, it's super violent. All right. And like one of them, the main Power Ranger is played by James Vanderbeek, and he's going around and killing all the others. Oh, all right. And so I, I might check that out because it's a parody, but in terms of yeah, like. <laughs> In terms of the lore of Power Rangers and stuff, like, mm, I don't know. You might as well be explaining to me the origin story of the Powerpuff Girls. It's all the same to me. All right, Dre, what else you got for me? Next up, we got Blue Boy. Blue Boy. Hi, Sifu. Yeah, Blue Boy is, hi, Sifu Alex. I just did a Google. He did a Google. There, sounds did dangerous. a Google. There was going to be an Enter the Dragon reboot with the Deadpool director doing it, and can't you too much? Oh, I uh, wait, doing it, can't find too much about it though. Uh, yeah, because I don't think it's really gonna heard about that. Uh, they've been threatening remakes and reboots of I think every single film ever made since. The last 15 years, because what, what does Hollywood do now? All they do is reboot and uh -huh. remake stuff because they have no new ideas. They are bereft of ideas. Yeah, they're bereft of ideas. And then, you know, and it's always, um, okay, let's take an old idea, uh, something that was popular in the past, and let's ruin it. Let's ruin it. Let's take it out. And it's going to be a movie no one's going to want to watch. Um, and, uh, you know, the remake of Enter the Dragon that's been talked about for a while. The director Brett Ratner <laughs> had talked about it for a while. Um, you can't talk bad about Brett Ratner, even though he's I know he's been kind of canceled. I said nothing. Uh -huh. I just made noise. <laughs> uh, the only reason I know this is my my well, my my cousin is actually 
very close to Brett Ratner. Um, in fact, oh, they, wow. they, no, they, they grew they grew up, they were next door neighbors. And uh, my uh, cousin was the, um, the best man at Brett Ratner's wedding. So he knows Brett very oh, well. Wow. So every time I see him, he tells me stuff. And oh, wow. he told me like, yeah, he said, Brett had wanted to do that for a while. And my cousin, uh, regularly talked him down <laughs> because my cousin's also a huge Bruce Lee fan. It's like, nah, man, you can't do that. Are we going to get to like, you can't do that without Bruce Lee and you can't do that. And there's yeah. no one who can, who has Bruce Lee's charisma. What are you going to do? Remake enter the dragon and do it with Michael Jai white. Like who's going to watch Ooh. that movie. Who's going to watch that movie Ooh. because it's a Bruce Lee movie. All right. You, 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 you can't, who, who are you going to put in Bruce Lee's place? You're going to put, um, uh, Donnie Yen? Who's going to watch uh. that movie? Who are you going to put in Bruce Lee's place? Uh, some Canadian? Who are you going to put in Bruce Lee's place? <laughs> some Canadian? Who's going to watch Who's going to watch that movie uh. with a Chinese actor swapped out? Who's going to watch that movie with any other actor swapped out? Who's going to want to watch that movie? No one. No one. I mean, the, right? the Karate Kid reboot was pretty good. The, the the one with Jackie Chan? The one with Jackie Chan, yeah. That was a good reboot. Yeah, but it did nothing. Uh, no, it. no, it wasn't. And it also did nothing. It didn't kickstart a franchise. It didn't kickstart a new franchise, like Mikey Dean just said. Should have been called the Kung uh, Fu Kid, because that's what he actually learned from Jackie Chan. That's what he actually learned. Uh, Damn. No. It wasn't even karate. Dude, I, I, I don't like this. Okay, here's a script of a movie we loved back in the days. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and copy my work, change some of the names, and make that a thing. Change your style. Change no, your I, I, I don't want to watch it. How much better is Cobra Kai than the Karate Kid reboot? How much better? You know why? Because you know and give a shit about those characters. If they were going to remake Enter the Dragon, it would only make sense if they had some of the original characters. So the entire original yeah. cast of that film is dead. Bruce Lee, mm. dead. Jim Kelly, dead. John Saxon, dead. Sekin, dead. Anna Capri, dead. The only one alive is Bolo. You're going to make a... But Bolo <laughs> dies in Enter the Dragon, so he can't even be in it. Angela Mao. Angela Mao doesn't want to make movies if you held a gun to her head, all right? And her character died in Enter the Dragon, okay? Damn. So the two people Damn. from Enter the Dragon who are still alive... Okay, their characters died in Edge of the Dragon. And everyone who was like a hero is dead. All right. They're all gone. They're all gone. Yeah, that's Ching, what, Ying, that's everyone, everyone is gone. All right. So how are you going to remake that movie? The only thing that would make sense, which we talked about in the previous podcast, which is a, a script idea that's been talked about by a few different people, is the whole Daughters of Han idea. The idea, you know, that Han has those daughters. I yeah, we talked we talked about this before. I like when yeah. I say it how surprised you look, and I go, Did, did Dre forget that I talked about this already? <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just... Uh and uh, you know, the, because the daughters of Han, they survived because they're not in mm -hmm. that end fight scene. So they might want to get revenge on Lee for killing their father, revenging on them or whatever, right? Because they were also personally trained as Han's bodyguards, so they know martial arts. You have a built-in sequel right there. But it's 50 years too late. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know yeah. about that. I don't know about that. But the thing is, they threaten remakes all the time. They also, for the longest time, were going to, quote unquote, finish or remake Game of Death using CGI in Korea. Uh, basically creating a CGI Bruce Lee to, to, to do all the scenes that he did not film, which is the entire movie minus the three fight scenes that he did shoot. But that never materialized. And I don't think anyone really will. The problem is that I think Hollywood will talk about these things and they kind of put them out there to see what the audience reaction is as a feeler. And it's never good. So then they end up not doing it. And at least in the case of these Bruce Lee remakes, uh, in other things like terminator or other films they point break, point break they, they they go with uh, a total recall they go and remake it when there's no need and no desire no market for it oh, but what? um point break no I, I, yeah it was a reboot of point break and yeah. the fact that you don't know it because I'm Drake, glad i don't know I, I love you and you're my boy but if i was a marketing executive you're the guy i would uh uh market to <laughs> the for the reboot of point break <laughs> and the fact that you don't even know that they did that yeah. literally says everything. Like, right? 
So um, uh, no, I, I I don't agree with the CGI thing because the as great as CGI is, is still not. Yeah, believable as you still people. have what's known as the uncanny valley. You would see the Bruce Lee scenes that he shot with Kareem and and Jihan Jay and Dan and Asanto, uh-huh. and then you would see the computerized version, and you'd be like, it's not the same thing, unless yeah. they took that footage and computerized it in the same CGI style as what they would do with the rest of the movie. So then the movie would look the same all the way through. That might be uh-huh. a way to do it, but the thing is, who really wants that? As as much as people scream and. Ch- chirp about no 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 bruce lee totally had a full script for game of death he didn't he had a basic outline and he was Uh totally willing to change that outline at the last minute to you know shoehorn in george lazenby because why because they got him and no one in hollywood wants to hire him so uh let's uh put in george lazenby not as a bad guy he'll be kind of like my partner okay and this these are the discussions they were having on the day of bruce lee's death supposedly so please do Finally. not tell me that there was a ready-made script for Game of Death when at the time of Bruce Lee's death, they were figuring out how to shoehorn George Lazenby into a story they had not yet fleshed out. So uh, so I think the hardcore Bruce Lee guys know that whatever Game of Death story they cobbled together, it's not mm-hmm. going to be what Bruce Lee would have done. Uh, and then who else is going to want to watch that? So um, anyway. I think we have time for one more quick question. It's going to be a short episode today because it took us a little while to get set up. Yeah. Uh, Next up, we got Jim Kelly. I mean, the Jim Jim Kelly. Kelly. Is he angry that I said he was dead and couldn't be in the reboot? John Kelly. All right. Yes. John Kelly. Forgive me. Forgive me with that. That was a flub. You're you're, you're, You're forgiven. Correction on Bob Wall E.T. Karate Gi. Or ETZ karate gi. I'm assuming. I'm gonna cut you meant. off. I'm gonna cut you off because I read this comment. Yeah, he had a white karate gi, not a yellow one. All right. Okay. I, I read that too because I said he had a yellow one when he sold it. What a, I don't know. In my mind's eye, I see him wearing a yellow one, but he had the he had the white one with the big patch on. Okay, fine, big deal. Not worthy of a final question of our podcast. What's the next one? <laughs> oh no, I gotta scroll past these. Bruce Lee death ones. I got a couple more here. Bruce Lee death, Bruce Lee death, Bruce Lee death. Ain't talking about it. Uh, Oh, no. Another one? Jesus. Okay. Mm. I've already typed Dryson in, in case. Mikey's already ready that it's going to be some kind of Dryson question, but we don't know. No, it's not. It's not. All right, what you got? No, the the one that I scroll by is, 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 that's, Total yeah, you, Bruce Lee death. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I scrolled by a Dreisen question. I'm like, <laughs> it's something you could never, ever, ever say. No. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. They're just all over the place with these. Yep. Um, let's go with this one here. <laughs> From TK. Mm-hmm. All right. Frequenter. Okay. Mm-hmm. One. Uh, no, he said, I agree with Dre. The T-1000 would have been the ideal role for Bruce. He would have added some lines philosophizing about flower uh, flowing like water, forgive me, being formless and the dualistic yin-yang nature of hitting like metal. By the way, got a copy of your movement book. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And his question is, do you have any stories about Sifu Martin Dragos? Uh, no, I don't. I never met the guy. Uh, no, no okay. a, a very, uh, very early on, before we started the Kung Fu Genius podcast, he, um, uh, I made a video of. We just blipped out for a moment there again. Um, okay, you can edit it out and post anyway. Obviously. Uh, the very early days before I started the podcast, kind of uh, the beginning of the pandemic before we figured out to do this podcast, um, I decided to do just a couple of videos to kind of help out some of my WT peeps. 
uh, in Europe, especially those who don't have a strong connection to the Chinese side of things. Because in my estimation, I felt that there were a few of my Western WT brothers and cousins and distant relatives who misunderstood some terminology that's frequently used in Wing Chun and Chinese martial arts, particularly when it comes to things like Dai Sifu. People calling themselves Dai Sifu is a, this is kind of an embarrassing thing. I, I, I think if you ask me, how, how could I embarrass myself in the quickest way in Hong Kong, it would be for me to walk into a room full of serious Chinese Sifus and introduce, introduce myself as Dai Sifu Alex. I, would, I think I would die of embarrassment to say something like that. It's not a title. It's very pompous. I've done multiple videos discussing it. And I also talked about this problem within WT. It's, it's our lineage only of people giving themselves the title of Grandmaster. And, uh, and giving themselves the gold stripes, which, by the way, anyone who starts their own association has any right to do. You can start your own association, give yourself big gold stripes, gold shirt, say you're a grandmaster, whatever. Totally your right to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to expect that there's going to be some pushback by people who understand that term and also find it a bit ingratiating to call yourself this. Uh, or to say, well, I didn't give myself the title, but my students felt that I'm now at this level and they bestowed me the honor of being the grandmaster of the school or whatever, right? I'm not a fan of the title. And I say this and I learned from Sifu Lang Teng who uses the title. And I think the problem is that because I come from WT, there's an assumption that I feel that this is a title that um, should be used, all right? And, and I actually don't. I think that the title is archaic and I think it needs to go away. Um, and I made a video where I may or may not have used a photo of his gold striped pants. And then he threatened to sue me in the funniest meltdown email. The comments he wrote on the YouTube page was so funny. And I didn't even answer. He got savaged by everyone in, in the comments, so much so that he actually deleted all of his comments. Uh, and in fact, uh, he, he got so pissed off and he said something so funny. Well, the first comment was, wow, imagine telling on yourself like this. And then it just went down. For, and the fact, and his English isn't great. So I, I think that he knew he was being insulted, but I don't think he realized how savagely he was being insulted. And, uh, and then he threatened to sue me for uh, using a photo or something like that. A freedom of speech issue on YouTube as an American. A German is going to try to sue an American, or I should say a German citizen, is going to try to sue an American on a freedom of speech issue for a photo on YouTube. Like, first of all, he doesn't understand fair use. He doesn't understand mm -hmm. how YouTube works. He doesn't understand the laws of this country. He doesn't understand international law. But worst of all, um, he doesn't understand how expensive it is to sue someone in another country mm -hmm. and sue someone in New York. Um, not to mention, I think he's ignorant that uh, most martial arts schools have liability insurance when we do get sued. So on some yeah. weird on some weird weird uh, uh multiverse where he could sue me uh, i would just refer to my insurance company <laughs> so i mean like but it was so far i was just waiting for him or whatever like i have no problem against him personally but hey if you're going to call yourself grandmaster you or you're going to give yourself gold stripes or whatever i also have the right yeah, to say it's kind of bullshit you might be the baddest fighter you might be able to beat me up and kick me through a wall or whatever but that doesn't mean you <laughs> understand what that title means and it doesn't mean that you've earned it especially if you can't order tea in hong kong how can you appropriate mm. chinese titles for yourself so anyway that's all i got to say about that dre i know it was a short one today thank you so much for joining me this was cool. We'll yes. try to smooth it out a little bit next time. We and, will. We uh, will. and, 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 uh, but I think it was okay for a first one. All right. All right. See you okay. guys next time. And every day Let I practice martial arts. <laughs>